So I'll go ahead and get started. Thank you, everyone. Uh, my name is Dr. April Khadija Ennis, and I'm the Director of Community Engaged Research at King Boston. King Boston, we are an anti-racism organization that works in deep partnership with the Boston Foundation and the City of Boston to bring a living memorial and programming to commemorate the lives of uh, Dr. King and Coretta Scott King and the time that they spent here in the City of Boston. And welcome to our session, Reparations. How do we envision the possibilities? I'm gonna start with our land acknowledgement. Oh, yes, thank you. So as we start today, we'd like to acknowledge and recognize a fundamental truth. In Boston, we are gathered on the ancestral and unceded land of the Pawtucket and Massachusetts, whose land has been stolen and language lost due to colonization, disease, and forced dispersal. Their descendants continue to steward this land, and may we find ways in our work for justice and equity to center the decolonization of the Pawtucket, Massachusetts, Nipmuc, Wampanoag, and all indigenous peoples around the world. And as we are actually gathering in person today, a um, special shout out to those of you joining us through Zoom, I'd like to invite you to consider the legacy of colonization embedded within the technologies, structures, and ways of thinking that we use every day. We are using equipment and high-speed internet not available in many indigenous communities, so I invite you to join me in also acknowledging all this, as well as our shared responsibility to make good of this time and for each of us to consider our roles in reconciliation decolonization and allyship. Oops. And here's our Black Lives Matter acknowledgement. In this moment, we acknowledge the beauty of blackness. We acknowledge the love, compassion, brilliance, and creativity of black people and the many contributions that they have made to the betterment and prosperity of the United States. We stand in solidarity with our black brothers and sisters as they fight for freedom, liberation, and justice and in demanding acknowledgement and accountability for devaluation and dehumanization of black lives at the hands of the police, government, and citizens. We join our brothers and sisters in their call for radical, sustainable solutions that affirm the well-being and prosperity of black lives. We join in their call for our global society to confront, combat, and educate the populace about racism. We join in their call to demand accountability for the history of enslavement, white supremacy, and police brutality, abuse, denigration, and dehumanization of black lives in the United States and elsewhere in the world. About his depiction of black beauty in his art, Kerry James Marshall states, I tend to think having that extreme of color, that kind of black, is amazingly beautiful and powerful. What I was thinking to do with my image was to reclaim the image of blackness as an emblem of power. All right, so this is an overview of our agenda. I'm gonna open us up with um, a quick sort of reparations 101 to get everybody on the same page. And then we're gonna do our breakout session. So we're doing things a little bit differently here where we're gonna have the breakout sessions first because we wanna hear from you kind of in an unbiased way and I'll give you some more details about that in a minute. And then we'll have our panel discussion. Uh, so I just want to really briefly introduce who we have in the room for our panel. We have, of course, Professor Ted Landsmark, um, who's uh, a professor here at Northeastern University. Um, we are also joined by uh, Maria Lattimore, who is the lead consultant on Homes for Equity, which is a pilot program for reparations. And then we're also joined by Crystal Cornegay, who's the executive director of Mass Housing. So with that said, here we are, Reparations 101. Yes. Thanks, Dan. All right, and uh, welcome again to everyone on Zoom. Um, so what are reparations? So reparations are a process, and I wanna, I, I, I wanna really emphasize that point that it's not kind of this one-time act, it's actually a process of repairing healing and restoring a people who were injured due to their group identity 
in violation of their fundamental human rights by a government, corporation, institution, or individual. And while reparations are a process, um, they can take many forms, and that's kind of a misunderstanding that a lot of people have about reparations, that it's just about a check. And while checks and financial payments are um, obviously an important part of the conversation, they're not the only uh, form that reparations can take. There are what they're called uh, collective benefits, which are um, very targeted community-level investments, for example. So why reparations now? And I just want to highlight this because if we look back in American history, we can only count so many of those watershed moments where there's this big opportunity or this opening to do something really big and powerful. So I just want to highlight a couple of these missed opportunities in our fairly recent history. So there's the first reconstruction that, uh, that came with the end of slavery. The second reconstruction that brought us to the civil rights era. And according to Reverend William J. Barber II, we are now in what many consider a third reconstruction that was ushered in when Trump was elected president in 2016. So we're in this very special moment right now where the country's kind of wrestling anew with racial equity in the wake of the murders of Breonna Taylor and George Floyd, for example. So what is actually meant by full reparations? So again, just to emphasize here that reparations are in fact a process that involves a number of steps and different kinds of resources to really constitute full repair. So full reparations is actually an international law term and it gives us some guidelines to assure that when we talk about reparations, we're talking about full repair and what some of those elements are. So in the interest of time, I'm not gonna go through all of these in detail, but again, suffice it to say that reparations are not a one-time act, they are a process that's really about community healing and community repair. So many have asked, well, you know, this, you know is, is this really possible? Has this been done before? And history teaches us that yes, it has. So the latter three groups on the list who have seen reparations most certainly deserved those reparations our Native American brothers and sisters, our Japanese American brothers and sisters, Nazi Holocaust victims, for example. But the first group on the list really surprised me that uh, right before the Emancipation Proclamation was signed, uh, slave owners were given $300, which comes out to about $8,000 or so in today's dollars per slave to ensure their loyalty to the Union. So slave Holders have received reparations, but slaves themselves have not. So this session, just to let you know, is about one potential area where we can focus reparations. So why are we talking about reparations and housing? You'll notice our panelists um, are, uh, are, are, are rooted in organizations that are frankly about housing. So we know, for example, there are policies that included redlining, legal racially restricted deeds, developers being denied federal construction loans if they didn't include racially restricted deeds, several policy decisions from the federal government on down to the state and the city are directly implicated in, in some of the disparities that we see today. So for example, we've been talking a lot about the racial wealth gap. Everybody has, has heard, I'm sure, the, the uh, Boston Federal Reserve findings that have um, and indicated that for median net assets, a, a, a black um, uh, non-Caribbean uh, household in Boston has $8 in net assets, whereas a white family has on average uh, around $250,000. So we know about that, and we also know that one of the major drivers of that wealth gap is home ownership. So, there's no surprise when we look at this map, one of the original 1933 Federal Housing Administration maps that uh, redlined, as you can see, several communities that included, and to an extent still do, many immigrant families um, and uh, other communities of color. And so there's no 
uh, surprise, if you really think about it, uh, that, that, that we're seeing these stark racial disparities in home ownership today. So I see that my title is obscuring a little bit of the questions here. But I want to get you all started in the breakout rooms. So um, obviously, I'm used to thinking in Zoom terms. So these aren't necessarily breakout rooms for everybody, but certainly for you all on Zoom. But for you who are with us in person, your table is your breakout room, so to speak. And we have a couple of prompts for you to respond to. But the first thing we're going to do, we're going to ask you to designate a note taker and a reporter for your particular breakout room or table, because we're going to have you all report back some of your responses to these prompts. So prompt number one is about data in the case for repair. So I'm actually going to very quickly modify this slide so you can see all of the questions. Much better, okay. So just to give you a couple of data highlights, so in the little orange table in the upper right-hand corner, there's that wealth gap data that you've been hearing about today. In the lower left-hand corner, you'll see this graph showing that Massachusetts has the seventh largest racial home ownership gap in the country. And then on the right bottom, you'll see a graph showing disparities in mortgage rate denials broken down by race. You'll see that, um, uh, uh, White applicants have a rejection rate of 4.7%, uh, and black individuals have a rejection rate of 10%, so almost double. Um, and, but I also want to give a special shout out to uh, Crystal Cornegue at Mass Housing, who assisted in uh, help, help, helping me pull some of this data together. So special thank you to her and her group. But we want you to respond to these, right? So what reactions do you have to this data? What questions do these data raise for you? And what other data would you like to see that could help make the case for housing reparations? Okay, so that's your first prop. Your second, oops. Please excuse me, same issue here, so we're just gonna shrink this down a little bit. There we go. So prompt number two is about imagining the possibilities. If you could design a housing reparations program, what would it look like? And then what do you imagine for potential revenue sources? So I'm gonna toggle back and forth between these two prompts. We didn't print them out to save some trees, but, but here they are. And also, our panelists are gonna be making their way around to the different tables and you know, kind of seeing how folks are thinking. All right, and then we'll let you know when um, we'll go ahead and debrief. So you have about 20 minutes for this exercise to walk through these two prompts. Um, and at, at, after that point, we'll go ahead and share out, and then we'll kick off our panel. Does anyone have any questions before we get started? All right, so let's get underway. I'm gonna be wandering around too. conversations that are happening, but if you haven't already uh, started to tackle prompt two, we're going to ask you to shift gears in the next minute or so, um, because we want to go right into debrief by 11. Thanks. I really apologize about uh, interrupting what looks like a really robust set of conversations happening across this room, but we'd like to go ahead and start to hear from all of you. So I'm going to call on table by table, and please just take, um, you know, maybe two to three minutes to talk us through the findings at, at your table. All right, so is there a table that'd like to kick us off? Oh, yes, and... Um, uh, the gentleman in the green mask is going to be coming around with uh, microphones. So I'm afraid I'll have to call on a table in the spirit of like professorship. Um, let's see. Ah, OK. Thank you. I figured I'd begin because we were just talking and I can like get to some of what we were just saying without forgetting it. We didn't have an opportunity to do a lot of writing. Hello, everyone. 
Uh, good day again. My name is Dee Farai Williams, and I am representing right now this, t this group. So one thing, um, if we can go, can you please pull up prompt one so that I can at least oh, yes. hold that, that in. Go back. There we yes. go. So there was not, what reactions um, in relation to the data, there wasn't a lot of surprise there. Um, there are some folks who are from Boston, have lived in Boston for some time. There are also professors at the table, um, so the, the data was not um, new. Um, what questions did it raise and what other data points would they like to see? Um, one thing, when we looked at this median net asset, we were thinking, or some folks asked, can we disaggregate um, around black, right? Um, really understanding, and what was raised is that those who are Caribbean or West Indian were considered more industrious at one point, and so they had more opportunity to get homes. There is a lot of home ownership as it relates to those who are black, but from um, the Caribbean um, um, Ben or um, heritage, and so folks really want to see that. Um, one other um, data point, yes? The north-south. Yeah, um, they would like to disaggregate around north versus south um, home ownership, right? So black um, populist people in the south seem to, again, have more home ownership. It's easier for black bodies to get homes in North Carolina, South Carolina, that's happening, as opposed to Massachusetts, right? Or on the northeast. Um, was there one other thing that I, good? Good, got it on the data. Okay, so um, we can, I think, skip to prompt two, because I'm trying to be quick. Um, we didn't get too much into design, designing um, a housing reparations program, but what we did talk about is there being um, more of a intentionality around those who are African American receiving reparations um, those who could prove that they were either had come from the South or who had been, for instance, in Massachusetts for a longer period of time. Because what has a tendency to happen is because of this mythology around industrious black folks from the Caribbean, as opposed to those moving through migration, for instance, who were industrious that came up here, um, they've had other opportunities to get homes, to get things, and oftentimes the system sees someone who is in a black body but is Caribbean, yeah. and they say, I'm gonna give that person, right, or who is an immigrant, I'm gonna give that person, and they're skipping over African Americans. Mm -hmm. So um, when we think about um, reparations, we, we, we talked about that. We also talked about the idea of doing some, um, this idea of repair has to come um, through looking at internalized racial inferiority and other components that um, happen within um, communities of color or culture, um, black and brown bodies, um, there needs to be a lot of education in general. So it's not just about giving people things, it's about educating people, so that would be a part of what I think, when we think about a reparations program, starting with those things and the internalization of white body supremacy in black and brown bodies as well as white bodies as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. Well, um, potential revenue sources, I think we said, come on, say again? Corporations. Corporations, universities, everyone needs to be giving as well as individual developers. folks, in, developers and individuals and in white bodies need to be giving back so the resources needs to come from there. And we'll say universities one more time, I thought I said that but I'll say it again <laughs> and again and again since we are here. Well, yes. thank, well, well, thank you so much to your table for sharing out. Um, and you raised so many excellent questions and points about the who around reparations. So classic teachings um, tell us that the body that's been harmed, um, in this case, black folks have to be the ones to determine what redress looks like. So the, the who determines the what, and then the what also determines the who, if that makes any sense. Because if we choose to repair from slavery, for, for example, that's a very specific population. If we choose to repair from 
um, uh, the, the big era of blockbusting, for example, then that's potentially a different population as well. So all excellent points, um, and I'm, I'm sure we'll cover off on some of those in the panel, so thank you. Um, our next table, do we have any volunteers or should I call on someone? All right, okay, I'm gonna call on this wonderful table over here. Thank you. Thank you. I'll get us started. So I'm representing a table that includes Sharon, Nina, Jenny, Maria, Rebecca, and myself, Lily. And um, in terms of data, um, we reacted in a way that we wish that more people actually saw this data, but also that the data was juxtaposed with um, complementary data that shows just how much wealth there is in the Boston region. Um, including those that are hoarded by um, universities and other powerful cultural and um, anchor institutions. Um, also, the um, data on the sort of fog of complicity and how many people are kind of just swimming in dominant like white supremacy culture and liberal culture that denies um, racial sort of violence and dispossession. Um, the other data was we wanted to see longitudinal data that shows sort of the systemic nature of housing and how this is cumulative and happens over time. We wanted to see data on inclusionary zoning and sort of the dominant inclusive and affordable housing approaches and how lotteries often don't actually benefit um, you know, black Americans or people of color, but kind of just go to grad students or whoever happens to ha prove that they have low income and can kind of sometimes game um, the system. We love grad students and they should benefit as well, but we're just wanting to disaggregate the data a little more. Um, and then also looking at the, how um, families actually experience the data you know, um, over generations, so connecting income, wealth, all that, all the different data points. Um, and then also data on what non-action would result in, so kind of projecting the effects and then contextualizing data to show how impossible it is to close the wealth gap based on individual achievements. So if people do everything right, you know, that it's still impossible to close these um, centuries made um, wealth gaps. Um, in terms of imagining the possibilities, we got very excited about this question. Um, we, in terms of what housing reparations would look like, we thought it's important to have an ethical disclosure of first generation home ownership so that individuals who really need it can benefit from the programs. Um, that property sales, um, wait, what was this? Transfer tax for reparations, oh, revenues, so that we can start um, charging transfer taxes to big property sales so that it can fund reparations measures um, we wanted to, we thought universities pay so much overhead for um, government grants and that a large percentage or a certain percentage could be committed to reparations mm -hmm. funds that are controlled by community organizations and agencies who are doing the work. Also, a percentage of construction and development funds, given all the university and institutional expansions, could also go to reparations. And then also just, you know, taxing um, the super wealthy people so that they pay their fair share and that the government actually collects the taxes, you know, re-examining capital gains sort of taxes um, as sources as well. Um, oh, and then that, sorry, I'm gonna jump back to what reparations would look like, that there's a sort of um, risk of only focusing on home ownership opportunities and that we also need to really examine wealth because we do have a majority renter town um, and also thinking about an approach that spans sectors beyond housing, like mobility, education, health, et cetera. We did name attention, which is that there's often inflationary effects, especially in housing markets when you promote ownership. Um, and do you wanna jump in? Sorry, guys. Thank you. Awesome, some really uh, powerful questions and observations coming out of these tables. This is great, thank you. Uh, next table, please. Wherever Professor Landmark says, please. <laughs> Hi, good, uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Yvonne, and I have my group here, Alana, Chelsea, Becca, and Madison. 
Um, and for prompt number one, some of our initial feelings um, was definitely frustration with how uh, the systemic issues continue to infiltrate our lives today. Um, and we were noticing the $200,000 um, median net asset by race and we're thinking about how for white people um, that most of it must have come from generational wealth and um, a lack of debt perhaps and also assets that they could have inherited from um, their ancestors. Um, and we're also thinking about how um, about how we wanted to ask some of the questions also who was included in um, in that study, such as like, oh, were homeless people included in this? Or uh, we wanted to see some more breakdowns of that information. Um, and other questions. Um, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, and for reparations, we were talking about um, a lot of similar things that everyone else was talking about, such as like a like a program for first-time homeowners, um, and also more education on how to apply for a loan, and because it can be a very difficult process and very. Um, hard and inaccessible for people. And it's also hard because people can be denied at any stage and not really understand why. Mm -hmm. um, and also maybe expanding with technology on and advertisements for people to learn how to be a homeowner. And also um, another idea that we had was requiring developers, um, community developers, to pay a certain percentage to a community housing reparations um, fund or trust. And also, um, I think there is one that is being done in, I believe, Highland Park Community Coalition. Um, and so those are some of the ideas that we had. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, again, brilliant points of observation, and I just love the way all of you were thinking about this from a holistic perspective. Like, for example, if we look at what's happening in Evanston, uh, Illinois, where um, uh, folks who are eligible and make it out of the lottery are getting $25,000 to either put towards a down payment or repair um, an existing home that they own, or even to pass that money on to um, the next generation. So it's not enough to kind of just do things like that alone, but there's also some additional resources that need to be um, part of that picture. So thank you. Thank, thank you all. You. And I think we have two more tables, is it? Yep. All right. Um, and I, I don't mean to cut, uh, cut anyone short, but I really do want to hear, um, have you all hear from the panelists. So no more than uh, two minutes, please, for, for your summaries. Is this on? Yes. Yep. Okay, hi everybody, I'll try to keep this quick. So um, so like a number of the other tables here, we were not uh, totally surprised uh, by this data. Um, you know, we had kind of seen some of these um, data points before um, and even data going back um, further decades um, about how the racial wealth gap has been uh, like known, you know. Um, I mean, this Federal Reserve report was in 2016, but it, it had been known about before then. Um, and so the question we really came up with was, uh, why has there been no action if, if, if this has been known about for so much time? Um, and is it even possible to resolve something like the, the racial wealth gap outside of uh, either court or uh, like revolutionary social change? These were two of the questions that came up. Um, and we also encountered this um, obstacle or issue of the, uh, the way that um, a belief in capitalism or meritocracy can create an apology for racism. Um, so kind of uh, um, like, defining it away, right, saying that, that it doesn't matter. Um, and we feel like that's a, a, a barrier 
to achieving uh, reparations. Um, and some of the data that we were thinking could help with that is data on intergenerational wealth transfer specifically. So um, maybe uh, supplementing these studies with studies about uh, the, the assets of people who, whose families have owned homes versus whose families have rented homes, things like that. Um, so trying to uh, really get data on the mechanisms of intergenerational wealth transfer in order to uh, argue against the apology of meritocracy and, um, and capitalism being kind of a, f a fair system. Um, so uh, in terms of imagining the possibilities, we didn't really get um, that far into imagining the possibilities for reparations, but we talked about this Homes for Equity program um, and changing affordable housing subsidy restrictions. Um, so uh, uh, so um, people whose parents lived in affordable housing um, would be able to actually inherit the house uh, without with fewer restrictions um, and build intergenerational wealth, right? This gets back to this topic of intergenerational wealth that's been mentioned a number of times. Um, and then things like a, a, a multi-faceted approach towards reparations, um, grants for down payments, subsidies for loans, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so that's all I have for, for now. Awesome. Thanks. Thank you, thank you. Again, brilliant observations and, and excellent questions. And we'll go right to our last table. Um, two minutes, please. And then we'll get right into our um, illustrious panel. Sure, I'll, I'll try to keep this quick and just focus on some of the things that haven't been said yet. We echo a lot of the really brilliant comments so far from the other tables. Uh, on the data side, uh, some of the things we noted, um, we were curious about the kind of like broader geographies of some of these things. What, what does it look like if you're looking at Boston proper versus the metro region? We saw Connecticut and Rhode Island are also there. So interstate uh, uh, patterns, why is, why is New England clustered at the top of this chart? Um, we are interested at comparing not just median gaps, but what does it look like when you look at a larger distributional account of, of these racial gaps? What's it like at the lowest decile or at the top decile of, of uh, both within racial groups and across racial groups? Um, thinking about not just that kind of one uh, aggregated statistic, but instead a broader picture of wealth and racial inequality entangled with one another. Um, we were interested on the right side, thinking not just about approvals and uh, denials, but also the way loans are steered. Uh, we talked a bit about Kianga Yamada Taylor's new book, which uh, refers to this term predatory inclusion, where black homeowners were actually granted loans, but it ended up being a worse for them because they were steered into segregated neighborhoods, neighborhoods that were disinvested in. And so reproducing that process of racial capitalism actually by promoting homeownership, uh, perversely enough. Um, in terms of uh, what to do, um, we were thinking a little bit about uh, the 2008 crisis and how there were political choices made to bail out banks rather than individuals or homeowners. And so how does the financial system uh, get supported by large scale macroeconomic uh, support from the government, from the state? Um, the way that education is funded at the local level here in Massachusetts and how that's a kind of force multiplier on some of these inequalities. Um, and uh, we were thinking about regional taxes, uh, real estate transfer taxes, um, and also how do you kind of move away from home ownership as the primary asset for individuals and families? It's impossible to have an infinitely expanding like home ownership bubble that goes on forever for all people. Um, there's inherently inequality baked into that proposition. So decommodifying housing and decoupling it from homeowners' sense of their, their own uh, asset growth. Anything else I missed? Awesome, yeah. thank you so much. Um, and again, I love how you all are even thinking about um, some of these other sectors like education and other sorts of uh, force multipliers, I think was the term that you use um, in terms of racial inequity. So thank you for all of that. Without further ado, um, I'm really excited to introduce our um, awesome panel that we have today. Um, I'm gonna ask you to please come to the stage. Um, first, we have Professor Landsmark, Professor Ted Landsmark, whom, whom um, I believe all of you know, know well. Um, have you come to the front, please? Thank you. Hi, Professor. <laughs> um, please feel free to have a seat um, and make yourself comfortable. And, um, but before that, would you like to share some remarks or well, just open the panel? Yeah. The first remark, of course, is that we're all um, re-socializing ourselves to what it means to be in a room with a, another live person at a conference like this. Uh, there are new protocols that uh, we have to adjust to. I want to um, ask uh, two questions. 
uh, particularly in relation to who our uh, keynote speaker was. We have a new mayor in the city, and uh, there will be uh, a number of new administrators who uh, will be setting policy for the city. We as a group um, are primarily researchers, and we're very comfortable with data. Uh, the question is, how do we take this data and translate it into policy, uh, to real actions, at a point in time that we probably won't see again anytime soon, that is to say, new mayor, new governor, and, and federal money flowing into town. Uh, the, the confluence of those three uh, is something that just doesn't happen very often in this part of the world. And, and so w we need to take our ability to manage data and figure out very quickly how to translate that into policies that are real programs. Um, and, and so my first question to our um, uh, panelists is, how do we do that? And then the underlying question is, um, given that so much of uh, this discrimination um, is uh, based in New England, uh, the, the part of the country that prides itself on its power and influence, I mean, if you drop out uh, North and South Dakota, uh, from that list of um, uh, home disparities, five of the remaining nine uh, uh, communities are in the Northeast, where we've always prided ourselves on being so inclusive and equitable and well-educated and able to distribute resources. So the second question I would ask is, why should any of these forces that have produced these outcomes, why should they change now? What is the compelling argument? We, we can develop programs, but what is the compelling argument that is going to precipitate change? Um, so um, I'm sort of facilitating uh, this conversation, and uh, who wants to start? And maybe, and maybe you should also not only introduce yourselves, but talk about the programs that, that you're uh, uh, engaged with at this moment and um, how they can precipitate change. Mic microphone. My name is Ma Good morning. My name is Maria Lattimore. I'm the project director of a, a pilot project called Homes for Equity. So I'll just give you a really quick overview of Homes for Equity, and then I'll attempt to answer your questions, which are big and broad. Um, so <clears throat> we talked about this morning how home ownership is the way that many families in the United States gain equity and intergenerational equity. And there's a three to one difference between home ownership in Boston itself between black people and other people, white people, non-black people. In fact, the 2016 study nationwide had estimated that without, without direct intervention, it would take the average black family 228 years and the average Latinx family 84 years to accumulate the wealth that the average white family held at that point in time. So while that was not unique to Boston, but nationwide, that's upsetting <laughs> in so many ways. So. Homes for Equity is a program, one of many, um, hopefully, programs, as uh, April said. Reparations is a process, and progress needs to be made. We see Homes for Equity as one tool in this toolbox that could be used. Should not be the only tool, cannot be the only tool. Um, people may have different ideas about the way where the, uh, the, the components of the program but there's opportunity and certainly room for all kinds of uh, tools in this toolbox. But Home for Equity is a program um, that's design being designed to close the racial wealth gap by allowing households of, harm, households of color harmed by housing discrimination to buy affordable homes and to generate wealth. It is a partnership of um, Nuestra Comunidad, which is a community development corporation in Roxbury, the Massachusetts Affordable Housing Alliance, also known as MAHA, and Opportunity Communities. So Roxbury currently has a population that is 90% black or Latino, so our pilot program in the Western service area is Roxbury. 
we are planning to build between 10 and 12 condos um, in, on Burton Ave in Roxbury and to make two to three of those condos in the Homes for Equity program. So what does that mean? That means that Homes for Equity has two major components that are different from most of the affordable housing that's being built in the city. The city subsidizes, the city and the state both subsidize affordable housing in this city, and Homes for Equity will be different in two major ways. Number one, we plan on explicitly targeting and marketing these homes to people based on race. Let me say that again. We plan on explicitly marketing these homes to black folks. That is against the National Fair Housing Act. But what people probably don't know, and this um, has not been leveraged, is that there is a very explicit obligation in the Fair Housing Act to redress discrimination. And we have been working with one of the premier legal firms in the city that deals with affordable housing, has written a substantial legal memo that we believe narrowly tailors home for equity in a way that will stand up to legal challenge. We do expect a legal challenge. Um, we have secured a research team um, that is doing a 10-month research effort to substantiate housing discrimination and the harm, and they will actually demonstrate one of their deliverables will be an economic analysis. One of their PhD folks is an economist, and we will have an economic analysis that shows the economic impact of housing discrimination explicitly in the city of Austin from 1940 up to the present day. So besides the city allowing Nuestra to market these homes based on race, which means that they have to approve the fair housing marketing plan, we are also going to negotiate with the city to change the deed restrictions that are on affordable homes, which in large part restrict wealth building. We understand that there's a balance to be struck between affordability in this city as somebody who was not born here but was raised here from the age of six, I understand the affordability issue in Boston. It is a real problem. But at the end of the day, there has to be a better balance struck between maintaining housing affordability and closing this racial wealth gap. And Homes for Equity is just one of the programs that could do that because what we're asking the city and subsequently the state is to allow people to gain equity appreciation in their homes more than they currently allow. Most deed restrictions from the city of Boston when a housing unit is subsidized by the city allow 3% equity appreciation a year. If you've read the Globe in the last month, you know that the average home in Boston has appreciated in the last year probably about almost 9%. So folks that buy affordable homes are getting one third of the equity appreciation now, obviously, there has to be some restrictions because they are affordable homes, but a better balance needs to be struck to, if we really value closing the racial wealth gap, which ultimately will close the community wealth gap, the two go hand in hand, then we need to get behind changes to these policies that strike a better balance. I'm going to stop and answer the question later, but I'm going to hand it over to Crystal. Okay. Crystal? Uh, yeah, I guess it's working. Um, I sound the same to me. It is. <laughs> no. Can people hear me? Is it working? Oh, great. Thank you. Um, um, I'm Crystal Cornegay, Executive Director of Mass Housing. Um, as April said, we had been working on um, at the agency really trying to figure out how to address the racial wealth gap. We think about the racial wealth gap statewide because we're a statewide agency um, and um, collected a bunch of data around a bunch of different things uh, and uh, decided that what we were gonna focus on was to do two things. One, the way we talk about it is there's a supply problem. We have a housing supply problem in the state no matter what 
we're talking about, um, but particularly in communities of color. Um, there aren't sort of quality homes being built for sale in those communities. And so we created a program that we call Commonwealth Builder, which really is about um, producing uh, homes that are affordable to folks at a particular income range with a focus on Boston and what we call the gateway cities, which is where most people of color live um, in the Commonwealth. Um, so that's a supply side thing. Um, on what we call the demand side, we have done what people call uh, uh, a down payment assistance program, but we really focused that on, uh, again, you get a certain level if you're buying in communities of color, and um, you get a certain level of assistance there. Uh, our, our newest flavor to that is um, if you're at 80% area median income and you're purchasing in Boston or the Gateway Cities, you can get down payment assistance valued at up to 10% of the purchase price or $50,000. Um, whichever, you know, whichever is greater. Is that how it works? Whichever is greater. So I'm um, really trying to figure out how to get at this from both sides. We do not, um, I'm, I'm, I, I, I've never heard reparations talked about as a process, so I appreciate that. Um, I, I, and as Maria said, we do not see this as, as kind of a be all, end all but we know that people weren't talking about, like we've been doing this since before the pandemic and we, part of what we wanted to do was to get people talking about it. Um, we had to negotiate with the city of Boston as Maria was describing to change the, uh, the deed restriction and, and we were able to, to do that successfully because it isn't just the value of the appreciation, the city's deed restriction was that you could not uh, leave the house to your heirs, right? The, the, and we were able to successfully change that. The length of that deed restriction was basically in perpetuity. Um, um, and we were able to work with them to get some of those things changed. So um, I would, uh, that, that's the thing that we're working on. I totally don't remember your questions, Professor Landmark. <laughs> 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 happy to try to answer them if you could remind me of what oh I do have one thing to say you were asking it occurred to me that you were when you were asking a question about what is the compelling argument um, my answer to that when people ask me that is like there is no one compelling argument because there is no one audience who you're trying to convince that this is a thing and so like with all things you got to know your audience and, and how and what argument might work for that particular audience. That is why data is so important, right? Because something that, I mean, you could see in this group, something that one group finds striking and, you know, and encourages them to make movements and to think about is a different, a different data point will affect a different group. And so I don't know that there's um, one compelling argument around that. Um, and, and you can see over the past uh, two years, there's lots of data that has come out and talking about um, um, sort of, um, you know, stifling wealth growth in, in communities of color with people of color actually stifles the growth of the gross domestic product. And, you know, and that may be something, but, you know, until I also feel like until we get ourselves like we're a country that, well, I guess all countries do that, respond to crises. So until we get ourselves where it hurts enough to everybody, I don't know that there's necessarily going to be kind of a groundswell around how we, uh, how we move this along, which is why I appreciate the idea of process. The only other thing I wanted to say about reparations, part of the Commonwealth Builder Program is that we are basically giving um, a subsidy to the developer to write down the cost of, of the home, right? And so if you build a home, I mean, it costs you $500,000 to build a home, um, we'll give you $250,000 so that you can sell it for $250,000, right? And so for me, when I'm thinking about reparations, 
that's a clear and easy path, but I want a path for reparative justice for people who rent, right? Because there are lots of people of color who rent, and, and that's okay, right? And so I also understand um, the elegance of first generation, but I don't, I, don't, I don't like it because it implies that if you're a person of color and your parents own the house, then you should be set, which is not true. Right? It's like there's a lot, of, because we know of all the other systems that happen. And so um, I don't want to get caught up in this kind of like first generation thing because there are many generations that we have to be reparative to. And I don't want to feel like, okay, I just took care of that generation so we're all set. Right? It's like, no. <laughs> it's like you got, you, got, you got lots to make up for um, in, in order to repair and have us feel healthy. Assuming that the... Um application of some concept of reparations uh, takes place um, and that it's all part of a process. Um, I think it's reasonable to assume that even a decade from now, all the disparities will not have been eliminated. So the question I pose for the three of you is, what is success going to feel like in a way that uh, in individuals and communities feel as though progress is actually being made towards the elimination of these disparities. I mean, if, if the housing impact goes down 2% or 3% in Boston, if the disparity goes down, are we, we going to really feel as though we've made progress? What, what are the metrics that you're likely to use uh, uh, as evidence of success? Thank you. Thank you. Well, first of all, I want to give huge props to Crystal because that Commonwealth Builder Program was very, very significant. That was hugely, that was a lot of effort and a lot of work. And in fact, for Homes for Equity, we are looking at that, that inheritability thing. I mean, just thank you for doing that, truly. Um, so the measures, um, that's a good question. And, and I just want to get back to the compelling um, argument for it, and then I'll talk about how we, uh, I think one of the measures we can do. So Crystal mentioned um, you know, GDP. So I think it was probably about three or four years ago, there was a nationwide study that had come out um, from that major organization that, um, that April had up on the screen around uh, defining reparations that had estimated that the impact on GDP of um, enslaved people, right? And so it was huge. I don't even remember what the number was. Maybe somebody has it at hand. But there is a cost to this country of you know, people not fulfilling their full uh, potential, not leveraging their full potential. There's a cost to every single one of us in this room from people of color and black people, in spe black people specifically not being able to be their full self professionally and at a human and personal level um, to each of us economically. So if, a, if you're a bottom line kind of person, so anybody that's a bottom line kind of person, those numbers are real, right? And, and part of what the research for Homes for Equity is going to show, that economic impact on the city of Boston, in the city of Boston, of, on the housing discrimination front, explicitly. I think another compelling argument is a moral argument. But we will never get there, as Crystal has said, until we can come together and even decide what morality is collectively as a, as a community, right? But there's a more moral argument when you look at the history of enslaved people in this country and not acknowledging the, the egregious impact of that to this day, right? Um, and so I think that those, there are many, many compelling arguments. I think that those are two, depending on the audience that you're talking to. I think that the evaluation is going to have to be multi-varied also. I think that the data that we look at to say that we are making progress, and, and, and this is not, we're not going to eliminate the racial wealth gap, and we are not going to build anything close to equal intergenerational wealth for black folks and people of color in my lifetime or yours. So let's be for real. That's not going to happen. It didn't, it, it didn't get there in 10 years or in a generation, and it's going to take 
multiple generations. And I think anybody that understands racial equity in this country understands that. And you just accept that as a premise. This is, this is our great grandkids. So if, I, if we see progress and what's satisfactory, I don't know. If the home ownership gap, just to take home ownership, in the city of Boston goes from three to one for white folks versus black folks to two to one, that's progress. Are we happy with that? I don't know. <laughs> it's a judgment call. But I think we can look at any of those metrics that are commonly out there. Our data is looking at, uh, we're building a quantitative database, um, looking at, going through the archives and looking at 275 homes in the city of Austin, half of which are in predominantly white communities, half of which are in predominantly black communities in the city of Austin what they've been appraised for from a tax assessment point of view and the differences. Um, these are homes that have been, would have been owned from 1940 up to today and occupied as residences. Um, we're looking at all of the data that the city has collected on these homes, the people that have owned them. We can't identify if they're black or white, but this is going to be a very large database and we could look at some of that data when we collect it at the end of the summer and, and three years from now and see what the difference is. So there's all kinds of data that's out there that we're collecting as part of the Homes for Equity project and, and we'll have to make a collective judgment as to, I don't think in my lifetime I'm gonna be happy no matter where we're at, but if we make progress, I'll take it. I would, um, I would think that after after 10 years, we might see some change in kind of a net asset um, measure for people of color. Um, you know, there are a lot of people making a lot of money building homes um, across America. And so it's not just the homeowner, um, but it's the insurance companies, it's um, the mortgage companies, it's that kind of thing. Right, appraisers, it's like, you know, everybody's, everybody's got a little bit of something in the game. And so if there were more representation of people of color in those fields, I would call that success too. Um, realtors, that kind of thing. Um, if there was, you know, uh, if every bank had a loan product that was racially targeted, right, that was for people of color, at, um, you know, I don't want to say competitive rates. I want them to be, you know, super competitive. Um, because until we get to that level of thing, these kind of programs that we're talking about um, are, you know, are part of the process. Um, but how we take advantage of moving this and making sure 10 years from now that um, people who aren't in the room and who aren't at the university now um, you know, are able to get access to things, uh, homes or whatever, if you're a renter, are able to get access in a way that's, that's sort of fair, we can, um, we can, I would call that success. April? Thank you. Um, oh, sorry. Yeah, so compelling question, Ted. And then I'm also grateful for what um, both Maria and Crystal have shared as well. Those quantitative metrics are certainly important, looking at processes and things like that. Um, and in addition to that, my, my personal perspective is we need to do more of asking community what success looks like for them, how they're defining that, and really start to shape measures that, um, that almost take more of a community-based participatory action research approach where community is actively involved at all phases in um, you know, coming up to some of these maybe um, more subjective metrics, for, for example, because I think about the construct of well-being, for example, that you know, countries have used gross domestic product as a proxy for well-being, but as human beings, we all know that well-being is such a um, far richer construct that includes some of these intangibles and um, subjective elements. God bless you. Um, so, so I would put forward as well that we need to ask and engage community fully um, you know, throughout all phases of the evaluation process as well. I'll uh, conclude this session on a timely basis in part because 
lunches are in this room and we're about to get uh, uh, inundated with hungry people. Uh, but I'll conclude this session by picking up on a point that uh, uh, Crystal made. Um, one correlation that is clear to me from uh, the um, disparities that exist in the Northeast um, is that if one looks at the real estate industry, uh, residential or commercial, if one looks at the banking and finance industry uh, covering uh, either large scale or small scale uh, projects, if one looks at the legal industry that deals in issues of, of housing and um, uh, real estate development, if one looks at the law firms uh, that are involved with this work, if one looks even at the public agencies with the exception of crystals, um, uh, both uh, uh, city and state, if one looks at the universities that are educating people who go into fields related to the built environment and home building, if one looks at this room, one sees very few people of color and very few community people who are involved in bringing about change in this industry. And if there is anything uh, that this university can do, uh, it is to make a commitment uh, to uh, both uh, engaging communities and uh, in educating this next generation of practitioners and professionals who are going to be innovative in each one of those areas, from appraisal to home building to marketing to real estate development. And we just haven't done it. And our institutions have, for decades, made commitments to the effect that we're going to bring about that kind of change. And it hasn't happened. Change inevitably starts with ourselves. And uh, I, for one, will, will thank our, our panelists for um, challenging us, really, uh, and as an educational institution. Uh, to bring about the kind of change that will lead to changes in that broader realm. So my thanks to the three of you, my thanks to all of you in this room. Um, lunch is along there. I don't know that I'm the person who's authorized to tell you that you uh, can start to uh, take that. What, I am? Go for it. And thank you all.